So our next speaker is Daniel Hayhow, who is a research lead in urban conservation for Earthwatch. And he is also responsible for monitoring and research around tiny forests in the UK. So I am very, very excited to hear what he has to say today. Uh, here we go. Hi, how's it going? How's it going? Morning, morning, Alan. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. I am so excited for your talk. Tiny forests, Great. that just... <laughs> Just sounds but absolutely brilliant. The name helps. Helps sell the project. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just saw that title. I was like, oh my goodness, I've got to see what this is all about. Tiny Forest, I gotta know. <laughs> Thanks right. very much. I will I will share your, your screen now. Okay. I, and you can take it away when you're ready. Okay, let's go for it. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, and I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about our project on tiny forests, um, which mainly focuses on the UK, but uh, we have links across the globe um, and following in a movement of these uh, initiatives um, that are many of you may have heard of in, in, in the countries where you are based. So first of all, just a little introduction to um, our work at Earthwatch. Um, Earthwatch Europe was established in 1971. Um, and Earthwatch is an international environmental charity with science at its heart. And the main um, focus of our work is trying to change, um, uh, drive the change we need to live within our means and in balance with nature. And we do this in three core ways. We connect people with the natural world. We monitor the health of our natural resources. And we use this information and this the activities to inform the actions that will have the greatest positive impact on our environment. And we have four core um, project areas um, that we focus on, and these are enhancing the health of our coasts, um, creating thriving places to live and work, reducing water pollution in our water bodies, and enabling sustainable agricultural land management. So the project, the area that I'm going to talk about today is in creating thriving places to live and work, and that's the area where I um, conduct my research at Earthwatch. Now, I'm lucky enough to be part of a, a huge team at Earthwatch. So this project is definitely um, a, a, a reflection of the activities of, of many of my, uh, my good colleagues. But Tiny Forests um, in Earthwatch comes as a result of our growing awareness as a society and as a nation, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a world of the problems um, of climate change, the problems of urbanization and the problems of people's disconnection from nature. And pulling all these three together, we know that there are, um, you know, the combined, the, the combination of these problems causes particular problems in urban areas. Now, more than 68% more than of the, the globe is projected to live in urban areas by 2050. And we know that as more people live in cities, there's going to be growing pressure on the resources and services within these built environments. So whilst there are many benefits and opportunities that arise from living in the city, there are a number of significant challenges. And many of these include things like um, higher temperatures, things that will be exacerbated by, by the effects of climate change. Um, as it, it, indeed, in, as also as a result of um, impacts of climate change, there's going to be increasing risk of flooding and intense rainfall events, which will um, uh, cause particular problems in urban areas because of the large areas of impermeable surfaces. Actually, the management of water within um, cities and access to water and clean water um, will also is also a, a challenge. And then also just the loss of biodiversity. We know from global reports and from reports in the, in the UK, such as the State of Nature, where we report on the loss of biodiversity from our, um, our countryside, but also from our urban areas. And another key factor within the problem of, of, of um, uh, nature within our urban areas is that the, 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 the problems are unevenly distributed. And generally, there are greater issues in terms of the quality of the environment for people of, in disadvantaged areas and communities in countries um, in lower levels of development. So according to the European Commission, urban areas are particularly poorly prepared for climate change. And four out of five Europeans live, are living in places which will be particularly exposed to these challenges. So we see um, in response to the problems that I've outlined, um, the benefits of nature are rapidly being um, 
increasingly understood as part of the solution and are, are often referred to as nature-based solutions, delivering these ecosystem services, which we understand to be really important. So why trees? Why trees in particular? Now, trees in the urban areas provide particular benefits. So that in response to these issues, we can see how the evidence building for how the benefits of trees really helps for um, capturing and storing carbon in our uh, reducing flood risks, keeping our towns and cities cool, reducing noise pollution, um, supporting stormwater management, but also lots of human benefits in terms of increasing people's physical activity, actual reductions in the risks of cardiac disease and stress-related illness, and also supporting communities coming together. And that for us is where um, tiny forests really come in as playing a part in, 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 in facing these challenges. So tiny forests are uh, exactly what they they sound like. They are densely packed native woodlands about the size of a tennis court. So they really are tiny. And these forests are, are, are going to be implemented in, in cities across the UK, um, with forming an oasis of plants, insects and small mammals that can support the well-being of the people around them. The forest will serve as inspiring spaces for outdoor learning and a social point for the communities actually to come together to help care for them, and monitor them to understand them. So with community volunteers, Earthwatch scientifically monitors the forest to better understand the benefits of nature in our urban spaces. Where does tiny forest come from though? So the tree planting methodology is based on a technique that was developed by a Japanese botanist called Dr. Miyawaki in the 1970s. And he developed this process to encourage accelerated forest development. Here he is, fantastic chap. Now he studied during his early career in Germany and he was introduced to the concept as a botanist of potential natural vegetation. And this is about what should be growing in an area um, were there no human influence. And as a vegetation scientist, he really wanted to study what natural vegetation should be growing in an area and the conditions of the site and the soil and how those plants um, operate in, in a natural environment. So when he returned to Japan, he found it was really hard to find examples of vegetation that was undisturbed by human intervention. But what he did find were examples of these pristine forests that were actually called sacred shrine forest, sacred shrine forests, Shinjo no Mori. And these surround temples. And he studied these forests to understand how all the plant species would come together. And his aim was to restore ecologically sound native forests to function as disaster prevention and environmental preservation forests in urban and peri-urban areas. This was his key goal. So moving on from the 1970s, um, tiny forests, Miyawaki forests, were, have been adopted by organisations all over the world. Miyawaki himself has instructed people in nearly 2,000 parts of the world, in Japan, Borneo, the Amazon and China, and an organisation in India has picked up the methodology and they have planted forests, a forest have planted over 130 forests in 10 different countries. So there's a growing movement and we have joined this We've Earthwatch have joined the movement with our Dutch partners, IVN, who are who have been planting tiny forests in um, the Netherlands for the last um, over the last sort of decade. And what we've done is taken the Miyawaki planting methodology and we've surrounded this with um, an engagement activity, education activities with children and crucially the monitoring. So we involve citizens in, in, in monitoring these forests to see exactly what benefits that they deliver. So just a few key key factors about super tiny, super powerful tiny forests. So we plant 600 individual native species in these dense patches, maximizing the benefits per meter squared of land. Obviously in urban areas, land is at a premium. The planting method itself, I'll tell you a little bit about it, accelerates forest development. Overall, we're aiming for a, a, a self-sustaining um, uh, uh, an ecosystem that requires low maintenance and management that, in, that really reinforces the biodiversity value of the area and provides an accessible and inspiring space for people and we will be quantifying the climate benefits and the social benefits that are delivered by these tiny forests through our program. So how can you possibly plant 600 trees in such a tiny area and expect them to grow and thrive? Well, the key comes through the methodology. So we follow a very um, um, a careful path of pro step, process of steps that enable us to assess a site for what suitability. So this is right tree in the right place for the right purpose, which is so key at the moment with so many tree planting initiatives. We can't just plant these, these forests anywhere and they will only be suitable in particular areas. And we go through a process of understanding and researching the soil 
We use the soil survey to and a local reference forest to actually choose the species that we plant. So every tiny forest will have a slightly different composition of species. And the key thing here is we, we combine tree species from the different canopy layers. So we may have 10% of the species that are planted are shrubs. The next 20% might be understory canopy, sub canopy and the canopy. And by layering the trees like this, we're maximizing the vertical space, maximizing the niches within which each tree can operate so that by planting so densely, they all have the, the they are, we are reducing the level of competition above ground. And we also aim to plant a small a smaller percentage of pioneer species. So these are the species that, that augment the growth of the forest, but we don't want too many of them. So they overtake from those climax species later on in the forest's life. So a key part of the method is, is soil preparation. So why do we do this? So urban areas have a real problem with um, uh, compaction of the soil, um, where the soil has got too um, uh, compacted down to allow the roots to grow. So what we do is we actually excavate the ground and we add in um, organic um, manure and materials specific to the soil. So we test the soils and decide what, what composition needs to be added to it to provide enough growing medium for the trees. So this is allowing enough space for the roots to grow, but also adding the organic materials means we're, we're releasing nutrients slowly into the soil and it breaking down, it's opening up pores in the soil, which again adds to the, it in, increases the decompaction. So all of these factors are, are giving these trees the best possible start in, in life. What it also does by decompacting the soil like this is we're improving the water holding capacity. So I know I mentioned at the start the problem of flooding in some urban areas and dealing with um, uh, extreme rainwater events. We intend that the forest not only has enough water for itself, but it can also um, help mitigate effects of flooding in urban areas. So it's estimated that 1% increase in the organic matter we add um, into the top layer of soil offers up to uh, offers a greater increase of water to the plants of four to six millimeters for every one percent increase so the plants themselves have a better chance of surviving even if there are drought conditions which is also a problem in some urban areas in the in the world so the other aspect of the success of our forest is the big community planting day. Unfortunately for COVID this year, uh, we haven't been able to get people together as we would like to, to plant the forest. And we've had to rely on contractors doing this, but it means we have forests in the ground that we can get people together around uh, to work together. Um, we plant all the tree species randomly in the forest um, so that uh, we're not so they're not competing with the same species next to each other and we add a layer of mulch over the top to suppress the weeds and provide additional nutrients. Often there's a bench area, benches and a seating area or a small classroom within the forest itself and this provides opportunities for the people living there to take part and to, um, to really engage with the forest on their doorstep. We recruit for each tiny forest a keeper team. So we have now have a network of 70 volunteers across the UK who form the keeper teams for each forest. And they're like the, our ambassadors for the forest. They, they get involved in checking and keeping an eye on it in its first couple of years when it might need a little bit of help just to keep it going. Um, and and these, these people have found come from all sorts of different walks of life and get loads of really um, uh, you know, good experiences so far, uh, and we've had some really good engagement with them in taking care of their own tiny forest. So, where are we to date? So, Tiny Forest has been running with Earthwatch just for 18 months, and we have actually planted 17 tiny forests in the UK, which was really, really exciting, especially during a global pandemic. And we've worked in partnership with um, Keep Wales Tidy to plant a further five in Wales. And our ambition is to plant 150 tiny forests by 2023. So, we're really going all out with this, and we've got lots and lots of partners that we work with, and lots of funders and landowners. And they all come together to bring together all these different stakeholders and the communities where these forests are, are being um, put in to um, to really build a sustainable movement to impact the um, the local environment but also our communities so just a little uh, array of photos it takes a little while to load because they're so many of them from our plantings this season we were lucky enough to get some kids out from schools who were in schools during the planting season to plant our tiny forests and the, the photo at the bottom from the drone image shows you just how how tiny our tiny forests are but 
they are really exciting um, to see how they will grow. And one of the key factors, a story from the Netherlands about how um, how the community really embraced the forest is that school children um, who plant a tiny forest in maybe the first few years of their schooling life when they're six or seven, by the time they're leaving school 10 years later, that forest will actually have developed into a forest. It's not just still a few sticks. And they will have seen that, that forest development due to this accelerated um, uh, uh, growth um, of the forest through, to, through the planting methodology. But the key thing is we really want to understand the benefits that are delivered by tiny forests, not just um, to, to um, demonstrate um, you know, the importance of trees in urban areas and the importance of trees um, to people, but also to understand the methodology and understand and quantify the benefits that are delivered by planting in this way compared to other traditional tree planting methods. So we've designed a monitoring program and this monitoring program um, involves working with citizen scientists. So individual volunteers, non-specialists non who can come in and take part in the scientific program and collect data that really will help us build the evidence base for tiny forests and for urban um, nature-based solutions. So the four elements that we're going to be monitoring um, from our tiny forests is the amount of carbon that is captured, which we estimate and hope to be um, enhanced by the um, by the uh, quicker um, growth rates and forest and, and forest development. So we will be measuring the trees, but we also want to measure their growth rates to see how the planting methodology um, and the different soil types and different landscape environments affects their the trees growth. We're going to look at biodiversity. Um, so we're going to have surveys of um, soil dwelling invertebrates because we're really interested in the processes in the soil and how the soil develops because that's a core part of what will make the tiny forest successful. But also we're looking at um, butterflies and other pollinators because trees and native trees in particular provide a, a huge benefit and a huge resource for these pollinator species which we know are in decline in many parts of the world. We're also looking at thermal comfort, which is this idea that in, uh, temperatures are higher in urban areas due to the urban heat island effect and trees can provide a cooling influence. And we want to understand how cool the forests um, uh, themselves are, but whether they have an impact um, into the surrounding area and how far that impact might extend. So we'll be doing some measurements of thermal comfort. So looking at temperature, humidity and wind speed in the forests. And finally, we're going to be looking at the soil. So the flood management aspect of a tiny forest or of tree in urban areas is largely to do with the effect that the tree itself has on the soil. So it also has an effect by um, intercepting uh, rainwater in its leaves, but also by the, the root process um, uh, helping the soil to um, infiltrate the water and increasing the soil porosity, allowing it to absorb more water. So all of these factors are going to be monitored through our citizen science programme, but we are also working in partnership with academics and research institutes to do um, more detailed and more technical um, uh, analysis. And all this programme is, is building as we build the number of forests, the number of sort of research labs, field labs that we will have available to um, gain uh, a greater understanding of these environmental benefits. So I just wanted to mention briefly about how through this process, we want to create positive environmental impact. And, and Earthwatch Europe has a large, plays a large part in a lot of uh, European projects looking at the importance of citizen science for environmental impact. And um, uh, recently contributed to a book, uh, The Science of Citizen Science, looking at creating this positive impact. And, and we've, we've defined several pathways through which this can be achieved. We have data collected through our citizen science program from our tiny forests. So we can use those data to. Um, improve environmental management in of urban green spaces. We can use that data as evidence for policy to talk to policymakers and governments about what they should be doing and how they should be supporting urban green space development and the and the the investment in really high quality green spaces, not just you know the the, the sort of standard provision and what the benefits there are for humans and for wildlife and for the environment more broadly. We also see ways that citizen science can affect behavioural change. So um, the people taking part, the landowners, the businesses that have helped fund these, these tiny forests all get opportunities to engage um, with um, the, the natural world, to engage with science and the process of collecting data and monitoring the, the, the natural world. So there is increasing evidence that by taking part in these programs and taking part in citizen science that people's behavior and attitudes can change um, both at an individual but also at a societal level. We believe that by bringing people together in this way and this kind of behavior change you can have 
an impact on political advocacy. You can think about how people coming together around a, a particular tiny forest in their area could bring about a kind of a network and an empowerment of community action to allow people to feel like they can imp influence the environment around them. So these are these are all the, the sort of large scale aims, both of Tiny Forest, but of Earthwatch overall. And in exploring these pathways, we really want to think about what audiences we're engaging with, how we engage with them, what scale can this impact, can we impact um, both at a local, national or even international level. So just to summarise before I finish, Tiny Forests provide a nature rich green space for the benefit of the local community and wildlife. They provide amazing volunteer opportunities for local residents and schools to get involved with an outdoor classroom and a place for people just to take some time and connect with nature. By planting trees in urban areas, we're we are con contributing to national and local sustainability and climate strategies. And by supporting schools, we're really enhancing teachers' ability to increase their students' understanding of the natural world and sustainability and think about how they can take positive environmental action. The forests themselves have environmental impact through increased biodiversity and carbon capture, for instance. And we will be creating this science based program of citizen science activities and research to inform the development of nature based solutions for climate proofing our cities. So thank you so much for everyone for listening. Please do get in touch with us at Earthwatch. Um, and I'd be delighted to hear any questions or your own stories about um, any Miyawaki or tiny forests that you have heard of in your area. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. And if everyone has questions, then do pop them in the in the chat app. And uh, but to kick off, I've I have a lot of questions about this because this is such a brilliant idea. What a brilliant idea! I mean, the first question I had was like, how do you go about instigating one of these these forests mm. in, in yeah. the environment? Yeah, how do you do it? So it, it involves quite a lot of different people because you've got to pull together a whole load of factors. You need you need the land. And that often is the most one of the most challenging parts. Land in urban areas is under extreme demand. And you've got to convince the landowner that this is the this is the best way that they need to uh, that they should use their land. Um, so there's a lot of um, stakeholder engagement with landowners and funders and when it comes to agreement that a patch of land might be suitable we have to go there and check that it actually is there's again there's a whole load of challenges such as especially in urban areas pipe work um, we've found uh, landfill under sites so it makes it unsuitable for planting or sometimes you can remove it and plant it and enhance the environment that way um, uh, and you get you get the, the sort of the sort of agreement about the practicalities and then you also start talking to the community and bringing together you know is this a suitable solution for your green space is this a is this what would work in your area? Um, and you build this all up to a process where once you've established that it is feasible to plant a tiny forest there, then you can work with the, the, all the stakeholders to develop a design of the forest, talk to them about how they might want to use it. And then, and all of this can happen it can take months or it can take weeks. We've we've got some that have turned through pretty quickly. Um, but there's a, as I say, I'm I'm one part of quite a team at Earthwatch who are who are focusing on on getting it over the line, as they call it, and saying, right, we're ready to plant. And then when it gets to that, you've got to start getting the contractors in to do the that soil preparations. It's quite a lot more intensive than um, than many tree planting projects where you might just say, oh, we're going to plant two or three native species in this park and lovely. And, and there's absolutely a place for that as well. But these tiny forests have bring together a whole load of different elements that we hope and we want to actually demonstrate through our monitoring that they bring these enhanced benefits both to the environment and the community. How many, is there, is there like a, a, a kind of tipping point, you know, you get enough of these forests in an area and it improves mm -hmm. things or, or, or can you get benefits from just one? That's what we'd love to really understand, the combination of um, the local green infrastructure in general, so the local uh, uh, abundance of, of particular species and connectivity in, a, in an urban area. So it's exactly going to be part of our, our monitoring and research programme. We have um, a couple of bids in at the moment, hoping to get some funding to do a bit more of an experimental approach of this. So get try to put two or three tiny forests in a particular area to look at that connectivity and where where do you get that optimum benefit but what we feel for each individual tiny forest is 
these multiple co-benefits of the, the human experience and the social benefit and the environmental benefit of just adding more diversity to an area. You know, if that's all you're doing is putting in, um, you know, up to 20 different species in each tiny forest. Now, most tree planting methodologies, you maybe plant two or three different species. So we're really enhancing the biodiversity in, in any spot where a tiny forest goes. So it's kind of no, no, no regret scenario of, of planting a tiny forest um, and, 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 and we can hopefully demonstrate that you you enhance the benefits by the particular methodology. But we yeah, we definitely want to understand more about the connectivity uh, element of it. And, 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 and indeed, the ambition for 150 tiny forests across the UK in, in the next two years gives us great opportunities to within a city build up a, a network of tiny forests and start to look at that. I'd, I'd be fascinated to see what that does to the invertebrates in the different areas, because that, that would just be so interesting to see. Exactly, exactly. And there's always so many factors, aren't there? You have a tiny forest patch that you're monitoring, and then you, you will have so many different variables in terms of the connectivity and the, the quality of the landscape around it. But that's what, that's what makes the research really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I, I was really interested by the point that you made about the fact that it's hotter and the forest, the tiny forest is therefore going to be hotter. I, do you, have you got any thoughts about what that might do to the, the biodiversity in the area? You know, because that's, that's, that's something really interesting I hadn't thought of. You know, could you get different kind of uh, biomes in? in there's, certainly, there's certainly evidence for the, the effects of kind of microhabitat changes on the types of species that are occurring in different places. In terms of the climate change you go adaptation element we are still just planting so we've often been asked the question would we plant um climate resilient tree species um and at the moment we are not sort of within um uk and england tree planting strategy still planting native species is largely seen as the most appropriate thing to do um uh which means that the species that the sort of invertebrates and and, and fauna that's associated with that are obviously largely what you would expect and hope to find there um but we 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 really will be interested to see how these within even within these tiny patches how the edge and the center of the forest itself varies a colleague um, um, an ex-colleague of mine did a, a a piece of research on butterflies and moths with in hedgerows and just simply with a hedgerow the north and south facing side of it the different species you find just within that small you know um the microhabitat differences between the, those um those aspects so it's it's um it's going to be really interesting to see as the climate changes how each of how these habitats and microhabitats are providing niches that wouldn't otherwise be there because there's more shading or less shading in particular areas and it's so cool that because i mean this is fascinating on the on the scale of you know important for conservation but also fascinating from the perspective of a scientist you know that you have these like plots that you've made and you can study yeah. them from creation to, to see what i mean that's just a remarkable like study yeah. system to have absolutely and that, that's what makes it really exciting for us to be in a position where we're an organization that's implementing an intervention and monitoring it so i i've worked on state of nature report in the uk over the last um, six seven years and we report on the decline largely the decline of um, native biodiversity what we also try to report on is the success of conservation and there are so many success stories but actually it's really hard to get metrics of the success because we don't do enough to monitor to give that evidence base for conservation so there's a lot of movement towards this conservation evidence and um, conservation optimism these ideas that really we need to get this evidence that conservation works otherwise why would anyone bother funding it if we conservation organizers keep just saying everything's declining so what i'm really excited about i've changed roles in the last year is working on a project now that allows me to think right this could we could tell a story in years to come of the effectiveness of an, a particular intervention at the moment, but you know, hopefully showing that conservation really can work and we can we can have an impact on a wide range of biodiversity, and that would be really really exciting to be able to do. Yeah, especially with because I, I feel like it's it's often a problem with conservation. You get like a funding for to do one little thing, and then the funding runs out, and you don't have the opportunity to to monitor it. So it's so exciting to hear a project that has that longevity to see actually what you're going to do. We're still going to have to be fighting to get the funding to keep doing it. But um, anyone, anyone out there who fancies <laughs> but hopefully, yeah, the strength of a program which has, you know, this range of, 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 of sites and this and this obvious, obvious longevity with a with tree planting program. Hopefully we're going to be successful in attracting the funding that we need to keep monitoring going as well. 
And to um, like citizen science is, is just a, such an exciting area. And there's probably people listening who are like, okay, citizen science, you know, have you got any tips for people who want to start, you know, working on citizen science or, or yeah. better engaging community? Do you like choose particular stakeholders or do you go to like organizations that are already there? Like if you wanted to engage with the citizen science, how do you yeah. find the right people to work with? From our perspective, how do we find? Yeah, yeah. So we work through sort of three, probably three main channels. One would be, so the, often the corporate organisations and private organisations that help that fund some of the tiny forests, they will have staff for whom part of their sort of sustainability and sustainable training programmes can get involved as volunteers um, through their work. Um, so we access people that way. So it's like an, a work-based learning program. Um, we also work with a lot with schools and educators. So we work with teachers and actually training teachers. We've moved more towards training the teachers to be able to deliver stuff rather than going in and delivering a workshop and then going away again. So we're trying to get that kind of, again, that kind of sustainability in the education system. And then through local communities. So we are reaching out through our sort of partners in each tiny forest to just access that anyone, and that's the point of citizen science and, and the, the, the type of citizen science we've designed specifically for tiny forests is that anyone could do it literally. So from primary school children up to an adult who has never done science or thinks that science isn't for them or thinks that science is scary, it's about looking, it's about taking notice, it's about you know, thinking about what's around you and, and, and following what we hope are very simple protocols to get involved. Um, so and for anyone who wants to get involved in citizen science, there are all so many, the, the, the beauty of it is there's so many diverse opportunities. You can do it sitting at your computer, you can do it going out into the world. Um, Earthwatch has just started a new program called Earth Watchers, which people can look up, a uh, little plug, um, which is a, a, an online citizen science um, platform where we're going to be in creating new programs for people to get involved in and again it's things that you could pick up as a just as an interested citizen i'm interested in soils i'm interested in plastic pollution my colleague debbie spoke on on the, the global biodiversity festival on friday about that program so yeah all sorts of opportunities and um and in the uk we have a really really strong um tradition of natural history recording in terms of biodiversity so we're very lucky that there are all sorts of schemes you can get involved and do training to understand you know people think oh i don't know um i don't know enough about biodiversity i don't know enough about the birds or the moth species but there's all the the training is out there and if you want to take it further and really develop your skills then yeah just go for it citizen science is so great i i, I signed up to, to a scheme recently and it's just an amazing place to like meet other people who are like interested in whatever you're interested in the, in your area yeah. so it's great for the person doing it as well as for the organizer it's like win-win really absolutely and the people lots of people say you know there's been research into the motivations into citizen science hasn't there and a lot of that is about the benefits that people get just by yeah the social interaction which you know we all know after the last year is is really key and whether that's virtual or or in person you know there are really really important benefits to be gained yeah so everybody go and sign up for whatever citizen science program is happening in your Do area it. or is on your exactly so so brilliant well thank you so much that's been a brilliant talk and absolutely fascinating i have to look out for for tiny tiny forests in in, in nearby cities that's such a great scheme so thank keep you so much for they're happening all over the world so keep looking I will. I will. Thank you so much. Brilliant. And have a brilliant rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much Enjoy for joining the rest us. Of the conference. Okay, Thank bye. You. Okay, bye.